Hello and welcome to another episode of Popcorn and Wine. My name is Matt Blair. A little bit of housekeeping before we get on with the episode. As you can see, this video is still a lot longer than I'd like it to be. That's because Rick and I talked for an hour and 45 minutes on Star Trek movies, and I mean every single Star Trek movie. This video, however, will only cover up to the sixth movie. So it's the original series cast movies. Unfortunately, I had to cut the reboots and the next generation movies out of this video. It broke my heart to do it, but we wanted to make this video as short as possible, considering. Another thing to mention is please subscribe to this channel when you see it, share the videos when you see them. I've also set up a page on coffee.com, that's ko-fi.com. With that, you can buy me a coffee and that will go towards making this show even better and even stronger and more entertaining for you. Now that all the housekeeping is out of the way, let's get on with the next episode with Rick Carranza. And welcome to Popcorn and Wine. My name's Matt Blair. Today we are going to be talking about Star Trek movies. And with me to talk about Star Trek movies is a man whose knowledge of Star Trek has him on the top of Section 31's Most Wanted list. <laughs> Mr. Rick Carranza, everybody. Hello, hello. How are you yes. doing? Yeah, I had to. I had to pander. Yes, yeah, of course you did. Of course yeah, you did. Course, yeah. no, so we're talking Star Trek movies. Yeah. You are obviously a big sci-fi fan. Oh, God, yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is a man who has a debate show that goes all around the country <laughs> called Star Trek versus Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. So he knows his stuff. Because I, I love Star Wars as well, genuinely. Of I do course, love, no, you know, so do I. I, I, love, I, love, I love, um, and I You're allowed, by the way. You're yeah, yeah. Sci-fi sexual, that's what it's called. So like, I love like some Battlestar Galactica, I love like Star Wars, but Star Trek. It's where it started. It's my really. first love, man. Of course. It's no, my first it's love. what was it? Sixty six was when the yep. series started. We're mainly yep. going to be talking about the films, yep. but we may get into the TV shows. Yep. The Cage was yeah, film, and that was Christopher Pike, and that was the pilot. Um, and the only character that survived, well, technically two characters, the, the Enterprise, you could argue, is a character in its own right. Uh, but Spock was the only character that survived from that. Yeah. Um, and uh, the reason it got rejected, do you know why it got rejected? Uh, I can't remember. You can was, tell me. It's too cerebral. For oh, people. Right, yes. And also the other one was, is that they turned around and so Michelle Barrett, uh, who then became Michelle Roddenberry, yeah. um, was playing the character of number one. Number one mm. um, and they went, yeah, audiences are not going to believe that. Because she was second in command. Yeah, a woman, a woman could be command. second in command. Like Roddenberry was seeing this stuff years before anyone else. He was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he was like, yeah, no, no, this is what's going to happen. We're going to be equal. People are going to yeah. be this. We're going to have this and the next thing. Um, and, and the a ridiculous idea. Yeah, and a white man will still be in charge. The TV execs went, no, that's too unrealistic. <laughs> like, hang on a second, right? We've got like, like te telepathy, we've got transporters, we've got phasers, but the thing that's really unrealistic <laughs> is a woman being second in command. Yeah, and the, the weird thing is though, in a kind of fuck you, Roddenberry married her, yeah. which actually did make her kind of in a way second, the second in command, command of, yeah. of the entire yeah. franchise. And like, and like, she's literally been in it all. Like she was. She the, has. Yeah, she was the original series. Uh, she was. She then. She, she went was on in to a play. couple of the movies. She was yeah. Chapel in the movies yeah, as well. Yeah, she became uh, Laxmana Troy. In, yes, in, in Next Generation, Next Generation and, and she appeared in DS Space Nine. Nine. And then she voiced the computer. In the 2009 reboot, yes. And, and not just for that, but also for Next Generation, for Deep Space Nine. Oh yeah, yeah no, did yeah, the voice yeah. now, but she did make an appearance in the reboot, yes, which is yeah, nice yeah. that she did yeah, make it, exactly. spanning yeah. all current generations apart from the latest TV series. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention, we are drinking wine. Yeah. Uh, we've got some Argentinian Malbec. Help yourself. Cheers. Well, Cheers. To Star Trek. Mm. Ah. I tried to find Filipino wine, but uh, we. I just, I'm disappointed uh, you get, didn't get Romulan ale. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so going to the movies now. The first one that came out was 1969, Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry, 1979. Sorry. I was going to say, so like, my, my, like, I just, I actually had a very small yes. moment of nerd rage there. Yeah. The film was a reaction to the success of Star Wars. Yes. So, yeah, originally they were going to do uh, Star Trek Phase 2, which mm. was going to be a new series of Star Trek. Yes. Uh, and it was going to be pretty much a brand new... They, well, no, the same crew, but on a new ship. They'd redesigned the Enterprise. So, actually, you know um, the look of Discovery now? Yeah. It's actually based on the rede what the Enterprise was going to get redesigned into. Interesting. So, okay. So if you actually look, uh, if you go back to Bar the spinning saucer, Bar the spinning saucer, <laughs> um, and they were going to have. Uh, all the crew were going to come back. Uh, Leonard Nimoy held out. Uh, he was going to say he didn't want to come back, um, and they recast him. And there was a, a new um, a Vulcan officer was going to be called Zon. Then when Star Wars came out, they went, "Oh, shit." <laughs> we need to do movies. Yeah, yeah. That's so where we need so to they, do movies. they, that's where it's what, at now. What was going to be the, the what was going to be the pilot 
of uh, phase two mm. became the motion picture. So they beefed out the pilot so it became the motion picture. Um, and then Leonard Nimoy was like, yeah, actually, I went back on this. When they talked about the pilot of the original series of Star Trek being too cerebral and rejecting it, this was. <laughs> but what I, will, what I will give it is that um, it's, it did bring back Star Trek. It's the most Star Trek movie, though, if you think about oh, it. Ooh, oh, come ooh. on. Okay. You, okay. He's itching. He's itching. <laughs> he's I'm, itching to this, say this, you're wrong. This wasn't uh, <laughs> an opinion I originally had. This was actually suggested to me by someone else, and I rewatched it, and I went, oh, no, this is the most Roddenberry vision of Star Trek. Mm. Um, and it's flashing forward, you know, decades later. This insurrection. Uh, there's, there's what is it? How many movies now? Thirteen movies? Uh, fourteen, I think. Fourteen, 14 yeah, movies. thirteen, fourteen. There's a lot of movies or oh no, the fourteenth is, isn't that going to be the Tarantino? Oh, yeah, I remember. The good things about the motion picture, I, and there are good things about it. First of all, it brings uh, it brings us the new Refit Enterprise, which yeah. looks really, really sexy. It as hell. Spends ten minutes showing. It <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. yeah it's like, and it gives us Alec Alexander Cur Courage's version of the theme tune, which is yeah, the which next the, generation yep, theme started um, in the motion picture. So, so that, we have to, it to thank for that. Yeah. Actually. It has like one of the best things about I think one of the best things about it, and it's not actually the movie itself. It's something. That, it's the reason the whole movie came about um, and what it did, um, because I think it's the first time that I can think of mm. in movies, and I think in like sort of like any sort of fandom is where the franchise actually rewarded the fans completely. Mm, uh, okay, yes. and there was a letter writing, writing campaign undertaken by a woman called B. Jo Trimble. Amazing. She was a, a sci-fi author and wrote a lot of uh, Star Trek fan fiction. Obviously, but she wrote this uh, letter writing campaign. Hundreds of thousands, well, thousands of like um, Star Trek fans all joined in. They sort of wrote all these letters to Paramount, sent them to uh, Paramount, I think it was at the time. Yeah. They, uh, they want Star Trek to come back, and, that. and that's why Star Trek Phase Two started getting sort of mooted. Um, and then they went, oh no, we'll do the movie. Obviously, after the sort of Star Wars. Um, and then what happened as a result of that? Because like basically they were like, if it wasn't for the fans, this wouldn't have been done. Star Trek yeah. would not be done. And so the scene where uh, Kirk is briefing the crew about what's about about Vigar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 entire crew is made up of all the fans who wrote in. Our orders are to intercept, investigate, and take whatever action is necessary. The Star Trek is, it's like a friend that is always in trouble and you always kind of have to help them out. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, like, being being a Star Trek fan is about suffering. I think the motion picture sort of, like, encapsulates that because you have to kind of suffer through it well, you, to accept that it's back. But then flipping over to the next <sighs> film, which is known as, like, the best of the entire film <sighs> and was the cheapest one. It was something it's like 11... So, yeah, because they wouldn't... They wouldn't they, they, so they threw all the money at, at the, the motion one. picture. But it was all visual. And they went, well, yeah, you can do this, but we're not going to give you a budget, so good luck. They knocked out of that They really park. did. They again rewarded fans mm. for following the series because, essentially, it wasn't a sequel to the film. It was a sequel to an episode. Space Seed, yeah. yeah. Um, and that, cause that, it, so... Yeah, because when they were coming down to write it, so this is like Nicholas Mayer uh, was directed it. Incidentally, he's directed two of the best uh, mm. Star Trek films. Um, and when he was up coming to write it, it was the end of Space Seed, where Kirk sort of like they've abandoned Khan on SETI Alpha Five, uh, SETI Alpha Six. Six, six yeah. Um, and he goes, um, it's like I wonder what will, you know, what will be of the seed that we've sown. You know, I mean, mm. like that type of thing. Um, and that was like the jumping point. Oh. Let's go back. Let's go see this. Yeah. And oh, because it is all about consequences. This one. It's all about like you know he, he. There's a lot of times in the original series, and a lot of times in a lot of the Star Trek uh, uh, TV shows mm. where they do things, and you go, that's possibly not the best idea. Like mm. in 20 years time, 30 years time, that's gonna bite you in the ass. Yep. And in this time, they they, they actually explored that thing. Um, and it turned out to be brilliant. It um, was very strong from, I mean, like Chekhov was really good in this yeah, film. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was given so much more than he'd ever been given <laughs> in any film yeah, previous yeah, or yeah. any TV in show. TV. Well, that was it, it didn't make him look like a fool. Well, yeah, because like he was, he was, oh God, the, the dancing. Oh <laughs> God, I just remember the episode. Um, but like, if you look at the original series, he was basically, he was introduced in season. So this is the problem. So Space Seed was season one. Yeah. Um, and and Chekhov wasn't in season one. <laughs> Chekhov wasn't in season one. <laughs> he was introduced in season two. And basically he was introduced to be like, look, the Russians are going to be our friends one day. And he looks like one of the monkeys. So yeah, the yeah, yeah, to the kids. yeah, yeah, exactly. He was like, here's for the children, but also this. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, that thing is like, wait, I, I know you. 
Chekhov. And you're like, no, you don't! Like, I never forget a face. <laughs> Chekhov. Isn't it? You overlook it because, yeah, it gives. A, no, no, because it's good. Yeah, it's because good. Yeah, yeah, it's a good film. Exactly. And the, the great sort of moral story on this is that there's this device, the Genesis device, mm. that is there to life create. Life from lifelessness. Yeah, exactly. Spark is like, this is very logical. This makes sense. You can bring life to a lifeless moon. This yep. can bring life. Whereas uh, McCoy is very emotional about it and he has this brilliant rant about, like, um, you know, God made the world in seven days, but here's Genesis. We can make it in seven minutes. Yeah, he's, he's basically being Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. Yeah, ex yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. And I didn't don't... think about whether they should. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's Life will doing. find a way. Yeah. And like, it's just, it's just brilliant. Like, sort of like, and I, and that was for me. That was. Uh, I think they missed that so much in the emotion picture is that they made Spock very sort of aloof and very sort of away from everybody. Mm. Uh, Kirk was like, they, the Kirk was very like, oh, I want my ship back and McCoy was there. Um, whereas in this one, it was like the old times on the original series. Well, going on from there because it has one of the most famous, famous scenes ever. Spock, basically, Leonard Nimoy didn't want to come back yeah. to do, yeah. the, to do yeah. another yeah. Star Trek yeah. film. So the way that he agreed to do it was if he was given a glorious death. So that's why they invented the Kobayashi Maru. It's a decoy. Um, so that people would watch the movie, uh, they'd see Spock would die, but he didn't die, he was a fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would make people relax, so that later on, when it gets to the stage, and that obviously, you know, it comes, it comes up with the, um, the famous line. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. His... It's like a Bible quote, almost. It is, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, Spock, Wrath of Khan, 2732. That is actually... <laughs> Don't try to look for that as a timestamp. Honestly, <laughs> I haven't tried that. <laughs> oh, good. We've got some uh, some sound effects. We've got Red Alert going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's our Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> one thing that I always sort of remember, and I saw this on one of my uh, Facebook yeah. On this day things, uh, where I was making a really snide comment about a Doctor Who episode. And I was going like, oh, I was watching, uh, I think I was watching Wrath of Khan the other day. You know the, the, the scene where <laughs> the guy's locked in a radioactive cup <laughs> and, he's, and his hand is against the glass? Because it's, it's, it's so powerful. And it's like, especially because these characters are the characters that you love. Mm. Like, you genuinely, there's such a, and especially in that movie alone, the chemistry between them is that you get that genuine sense, you, you grow to love those characters even more. Leonard Nimoy, as you mentioned, he, he was wanting out. So that's mm. why he's like, I want, to, I want a death scene. And so he went to the movie, he went to the premiere of Wrath of Khan. Mm. And he was, he'd killed Spock, and he was just like, what have I done? Like, you know, he, he had that twinge of regret. He'd, he'd filmed the scene, he'd left, that was it. And he didn't know anything about the movie until he went back to see it at the premiere. And at that point, he was he was sad. He was like, yeah. he was like, I've just killed this character that I love, that he's actually defined him. He didn't just develop the character, though. He essentially developed an entire race. Yeah, exactly. And then it's that, so it, it goes down to the Genesis planet, and you see sort of the lush, sort of like, and it's, you, you think, oh, this is just gonna be showing you what Genesis is like, and then it goes over the torpedo tube, and it's intact, and it's landed, it was soft landed on the planet. Yeah. And Leonard Nimoy was in the cinema, uh, the premiere watching that, and he sees it, and he goes, I'm gonna get a call. Which led to uh, Star Trek Three: Search for Spock. Which is not a fantastic movie. But he also directed it. I, I enjoy Search for Spock. It's got Christopher Lloyd as a... As Doc a, as Brown as a Klingon. Yeah, yeah. Get out! Get out! It's just like... It's just brilliant. Um, oh, it's the, it's, the, it's the death of the Enterprise. It's so. a, yeah, it's a, what have I done? You yeah, know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's what, you, what you always do what you needed to do. Yeah, the death of Kirk's son. So that is, and that's a powerful moment. And like, especially because you've only met Kirk's son in the in Wrath of Khan. If, if you didn't know this, right, believe it or not, William Shatner, back in the day, was actually considered that he was gonna be one of the greats. I'm Captain Kirk! He didn't quite pan out that way. No, TJ Hooker was about as... Yeah, yeah, he didn't quite <laughs> pan out that way, but, you can see flashes, and like mm. a lot of people who have worked with him, it's like you can still, see, you could always, there was always those moments where you go like, one of those moments was uh, his son's death. Nimoy was like directing it, and he was like, your, your son's, this is the line, uh, you, you Klingon bastard, you killed my son, right? 
how did you deliver it? He delivered it every single way in that one text. So you see it, the way yeah. he says it. He says the line like four or five times. He's only supposed to say it once. He say it four or five times. And then like he, everyone like, so he, he, he stepped backwards and he trips and he falls onto the captain's chair. Yeah. Um, and people actually move to go to get him because they think that he's, he's had an yeah. accident, but he's like, he keeps going. And then everyone realizes that he's just, he's, he's, act he's acting. And it's just like that moment where you just go, you can see how much pain he's in. Bring on passage of kill my son. They save the day uh, and they take yeah. Spock back home. They put his brain back in, yeah. essentially. They've got, they've got the Klingon bird of prey, uh, the yeah. Clang's bird of prey, which, yeah, they, yeah. which they christen the HMS Bounty. Yes, yes, they do. And then uh, they try to go back to Earth. And this is the beginning of Star Trek IV, Voyage yeah, Home, yeah, yeah. also directed by Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, and this is the one where they wa everyone watched it and they went, Spock can do comedy. It, and it's good. Yeah, Again, it's, it's funny. You know, Eddie Murphy would, like, wanted to be in this film. So, did you do you, you know the backstory of like how they? Yeah. I know that. Well, I don't know that backstory. All I know is is that he wanted to be in the film, and they were like, "Well, we're doing this film, and it's going to be set in the '80s, and it'll be perfect for you." And yeah, all of this. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, "Well, what part do I play?" And they're like, "Basically, you play Eddie Murphy." And he's like, "I want to be a Vulcan." Well, first of all, uh, Leonard Nimoy and the writers of um, uh, Voyage Home went to go meet. Eddie Murphy. Right. And first of all, he said, I'm not going to, like, I'm great, you're here at my, ma at my mansion, because at this time, Eddie Murphy is like a global superstar. Like, he's like, you know, and they're like, great, that's fine. Um, and he goes, uh, I'll talk to you in a minute. I just need to finish this episode of Star Trek, because he's a massive Trekkie. So he's watching, so he's watching Star, he finishes watching this episode of Star Trek, uh, and they have a sort of back and forth and a talk and stuff like that. And what they originally, the character that they originally wanted him to play was like an investigative journalist, journalist right. who who comes across the crew and is like, oh wait, these guys are from another world or from the future or from somewhere. This is all a little bit okay. weird. Da da da, and sort of chases them around being Eddie Murphy. Um, it doesn't quite work out. Uh, whether it's yeah, I think as you said, I think it's because he said he wanted to be. He that. wanted to be a Vulcan. Yeah. He wanted, I think he wanted to really play against his yeah. type. That character then became the character of Jillian. Want to know why you travel around with that ditzy guy? who knows that Gracie's pregnant and calls you Admiral. I'm gonna have to go for some more wine. You're gonna have to have some more wine. So this is probably the most famous bit of that, one of, one of the most famous bits of that movie. Chekhov and Uhura in the streets. <laughs> Excuse me, can you show us the nuclear vessels? Where are the nuclear vessels? And so like, you know, mid-80s, like 1986, a uh, Russian man in the middle of America asking where the nuclear vessels are. <laughs> Not really a great idea, but they filmed that candid camera. So yeah. they, they, they didn't plan it. They said, look, this is, this is what you've got to do. Just go up to random people, and genuinely, 100% random people. Amazing. Go up to them and ask them where the nuclear vessel, uh, vessels are, nuclear vessels. Um, they, get a shot, so they get a shot of the police officer, like really dead staring at Chekhov. Um, that's genuinely one of the police officers who was assigned to look after the film. Oh, wow. So he, he, they, they put him in because he, the way that he was looking at them, just like, what the hell are they doing? Um, and then, um, but they, they, they go up to that woman and they go, uh, can you tell us what the equivalent is? And she's like, oh, I think they're across the bay in Alameda. Alameda, that's what I said, Alameda. But where is Alameda? <laughs> but, but she wasn't intent. She was just a random person passed by. She said it. That's so beautiful. And it was just like this beautiful moment. And so like they, 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 they shut down the filming really quickly after that and they chased after her. So that they could get the press for So they could the, give, release, give, her the, the give her the credit, yeah. yeah. So when they're on the, so when they're crossing the road for the first time um, and the, the taxi driver almost hits uh, Kirk. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, you, what are you, dumbass? Double dumbass on you, right? Um, so they tried, <laughs> they were, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They were trying to film that over and over again, right? right? And like they kept doing it. And in the last attempt, the taxi took it too fast and actually genuinely almost ran over William Shatner. So his reaction, like look, you, you see how shocked yeah. he looks and the way he hits the thing, that's a genuine reaction oh, of him wonderful. being angry. Sadly, after that, we move on to Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. 
No, it's the same way that you defended the motion picture. I am going to defend the parts. Parts? There are, no, don't get me wrong. There are parts of this film that I do enjoy. You start on a desert planet. Doesn't it sound familiar? Um, it's, and it's, it's, the planet, it's what's called the planet of galactic peace. And there's just one guy sort of there trying to draw moisture out of the ground, like a moisture farmer. Um, and he's there. <laughs> This, this hooded figure comes out of the distance. That sounds familiar. Hooded figure yeah, 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 on a moisture yeah, farm yeah, on a desert planet. Yeah, exactly, yeah, in single file. <laughs> to hide their numbers. <laughs> Who are you? And he pulls off his hood and he's got a Vulcan ears. By this point you could be like, oh, he's Romulan. And he goes, yeah. no, you're a Vulcan. And he laughs. He's an emotional Vulcan. Enterprise gets called out to it. Um, they... Oh, God. Are you thinking about Uhura's fan dance right now? That is, because I can't get past it. It kind of comes from nowhere, because it's not based on a previous episode or no, anything like that. No. She's just all of a sudden naked and dancing with fans. It makes no sense. Yeah. It, apart from the fact that it was directed by William Shatner. Feelings mutual. Okay, so what happens next? <laughs> well, it turns out they go to rescue these people, and it turns out they don't want to be rescued. Because they've all they've heard the word of L. Ron Hubbard. They, no. they are, yes, they <laughs> <laughs> but who is Cybok? The big reveal Cybok is, and this is the ever growing extended family of the Spocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. It's... It turns out Cybok is Spock's half brother. Yep. Big surprise, especially to Kirk. That was that was so funny. He's like, you're kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, you wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't explained the ridiculousness of the plot of this movie. Why has Cybok commandeered the Enterprise A? He has stolen the Enterprise A in order to travel to the center of the universe to find God. <laughs> ah, yes. The Enterprise crew try to find God. What does God need with a starship? Bring the ship closer. Now, do you actually remember the name of the planet that they find God on? Or God, let's say. I'm going to get really annoyed because I'm supposed to be asking the trivia questions. Hold ah. on. <laughs> the name of the planet they find him on is Shakari. Oh, yeah. Do you know why it's named Shakari? Because originally they wanted to play the role of Cybok. They wanted Sean Connery. Oh, right. And they named the planet after him to try and entice him into the movie, so they named it Shakari. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you hear it now? So now whenever you watch that movie and you hear them say Shakari, you're gonna think Sean Connery. Shakari, a vision you created. The next one is brilliant and I was lucky enough, when I was a kid, I went to the premiere of this film. This movie, in cinema. are you lucky man? This, this is so good, Star Trek this, VI, The Undiscovered This Country. is the one that, like, genuinely, this is the one movie in the entirety of movies that still makes me cry. So the best thing is that they got Nicholas Mayer back to direct it, so from yeah. Wrath of Khan, brought back from Indical Country. And it's just, it's Shakespearean. So one of the things, like, uh, the Star Trek originally sort of, one of the things about it was that uh, uh, the Klingons were the bad guys, the Federation were the good guys, and it was the Cold War. So the Federation were supposed to be representative of America and its allies, and, um, uh, the Klingons were Russians. So what they did is that they basically showed that the Cold War was over. Oh. You've got uh, Samantha uh, from Sex and the City. Yeah, Kim Cattrall. Kim Cattrall. Who Phenomenal. Brilliant. It was supposed to be Savick. Yeah, it was, yeah, it. but they, they said they couldn't do that because she was a fan favourite. Kim Cattrall, big Trekkie. Yes. So they brought her on board and they were like, this is your name of your character. Uh, this is your character, blah, blah, blah. She loved it. She says, your name character, you're the character we don't have to get names. Like, well, let's call it Val, right? which is the, uh, I think it's like a Greek or a Latin word for treachery or something like that. I can't remember okay. exactly yet. But it's like, well, let's call it Valorous. Valorous, uh, yeah, yeah. to make it sound more like. So she actually had that input on there because she was such a big Trekkie. Oh, and also, did you know the, the, the explosion of Praxis? Mm. It's the explosion of the Death Star. Is it really? <laughs> The bit that makes me cry every time I watch it, and it's so stupid. The swell of the music, uh, the ship, and then suddenly the autographs of all the original crew, yeah. of the original cast, start coming up onto the screen, and they sort of go away. 
and that's when I start bawling like a ch like I a baby can, I can that. because it's, it's them like signing off. It's them signing off. It's the last time you will see that crew together in, a, in an adventure, and there's like there was never going to be there's never anything again. They're not good, yeah. Where they're together, and it, it's, it's it's like yeah, there's cameos by whatever you know, like you know, um, Scotty turns up in Relics, and uh, McCoy is in Encounter at Far Point, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what's it? Uh, TK is in. Um, uh, oh, he's in Voyager. Yeah, Voyager, yeah, yeah. So there's so there's there's lots of things like that, but it's just like that moment. It's like you'll never see them together again, and it's like that gets me every single time. Yeah. I'm going to give you some questions. Oh, okay. Cool. I'm going to give you some questions now. Uh, you'll be pitted against other people's <laughs> fandoms. Okay, cool. Uh, and then there will be a school board. Eventually, it'll be either here or there'll be a graphic. It'll be whatever I can afford. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> how much was the set of the bridge in the motion picture? I'll give you options. Okay, go on. Was the set $200,000, $900,000, or $1.2 million? Oh my God. Oh, oh. Like, I know my, oh wow, but that's a, <laughs> wow. I'm gonna go B. 900,000, unfortunately it was $200,000. Oh, okay, cool. But That so. was my other choice. <laughs> <laughs> Which trick film was the first to use a website for, as a marketing tool? I'm gonna go with Generations. That's correct. Yes. Generations was the first one. Because I remember going on it. Okay, which movie was dedicated to the crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger? Oh, that was. Um... Oh! Oh! <laughs> it's one of two. It's one of two. Well, I can only accept one. It's either Search for Spock or it's either Voyage Home. Oh, God. I'm gonna go Voyage Home. It's true, it's Voyage yes. Home. So it's two <laughs> points, two points, okay. What was the name of the Orion woman in Star Trek 2009 that Kirk sleeps with, played by Rachel Nichols? Oh, God. I don't know, I don't know. I you can't don't remember. know, you're not gonna even take a part. I can't remember. Her name is Gayla. Gayla, uh, Gayla. I totally did not know that. And <laughs> horrible to think, her character's dead. The actor, I'd like the name, of the actor who played the Klingon prison commander from Ruopente, but also was uncredited as a Vulcan science minister. Oh God, I can't remember. Uh, can you remember his name? No, not at all. You know who I mean though? I do know who you mean. He's he in Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah. He was in Doctor Who as well as... Yeah. Can't remember. William Morgan Shepherd. Yeah, okay, cool. Or W. Morgan Shepherd, as yeah, he would have yeah, been yeah. credited. Which film director yep. makes a cameo on the bridge in Nemesis? Oh, it's um, oh, oh, and it's so problematic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brent. No. Oh God, David Finchner. No, 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 no. no. Oh, oh, well, oh, you I just have to call it quits on that one. Shit. Uh, usual suspects. Um. Oh God, I can't remember his name. Oh God, his name's gone completely. You did Brian Singer. Brian, Brian Singer. Singer. I will accept it, though it was a journey to get there. Oh God. There are only two Star Trek films with zero scenes on Earth. Which of those two films? I'll give you a half point for each. Zero scenes on Earth. Uh, zero scenes on Earth. Insurrection. And. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a. It's such for Spock. Wrong. No! Whoa! Okay. Yeah, they're on Earth. No, they're not. They when? are on Earth. When? When they're, they're, go, they're on, like going to the, uh, they're drinking, and they're going to nightclubs, and they're going oh. all of their set on Earth. It's Beyond is the other one. It's Beyond, of course so it is. You get is. a half point from that. You get a half point. Oh, okay, yeah. Beyond has no scenes on yeah, Earth. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Okay, cool. There is one actor who managed to do two Star Trek films in a row playing completely different characters. Who was this actor? Two completely different characters? Yeah, but was in... Two Star Trek films in a row. Oh. Oh. Wow. Jesus. Like, so, like, I pride myself on knowing my stuff about Star <laughs> Trek, right? But you have, wow, you've gone above and beyond here. I, like, I know he knows his stuff, so I had to dig deep. No. No. It was David Warner. David Warner. He was an ambassador in Final Frontier. Yep. And then the Klingon Emperor in Star Trek Six. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God, he was, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Oh! <laughs> well, the actor, Patrick Stewart, who plays Picard, is known to be playing Professor X. Mm -hmm. There are two other comic book movie actors who appear in Nemesis. Who are they? 
Uh, Ron, oh God, uh, he played Hellboy. Um, oh God, I can't even remember his name now. But I've got the first half of his name. Ron, right, I'll come back to him in a second. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Tom Hardy, he played Bane. Yes, Tom yes. Hardy played Bane. So you got Tom Hardy and Ron... Gold, no. Oh God, I can't remember. I can't remember his surname, but I know his name. He played Hellboy. I'll give you the half because yeah. you got Tom Hardy and you got that, but it's uh, Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman, that's it, yeah. Ron oh, Perlman. Again, oh, when you're putting this. Now, <laughs> now I get how it is when I'm actually hosting that show. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you see how hard it is. Yeah. Okay, last question. I think you should get this one with ease. What medical procedure, and this is in Star Trek uh, Voyage Home. Okay. What medical procedure does McCoy help a random old woman out with a voice? Oh, kidney transplant. Yeah, she's got. Yeah, yeah, she gives her like pills and she grows a new kidney. That's not the whoa, answer whoa, whoa. I was looking for. What medical procedure does Doctor McCoy? Yes, kidney they dialysis. Do dialysis. Isn't? I'll accept that. It's not five points. Yes, five I'm points out of ten. I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> I'm blaming the wine. Let's talk some in general movies. Okay, cool. Uh, now, what films did you really enjoy last year? Um. Oh god, this is going to be so controversial. I really enjoyed Justice League. Um, it, we finally saw the Superman that we wanted to see. Yes. I thought Aquaman was brilliant. I thought The Flash was brilliant. Uh, Wonder Woman was brilliant again. Uh, uh, Batfleck was fine. Uh, he was a bit he weak. He got some jokes. He got like, some... Uh, like, he, but he wasn't, he wasn't as good as he was in uh, Batman vs Superman. No, he wasn't. Was no. But I just... I, 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 Steppenwolf was awful. Yes. The, the the bad guy was awful. The CG was awful. But I really enjoyed it. Like I and I don't know what it was, but I just really enjoyed it. It's an enjoyable film. My biggest flaw with Justice League is, and this is actually my biggest flaw with a lot of comic book movie villains in general. Yeah. Is that the villains, especially Steppenwolf, doesn't have anyone to talk to. Yeah. He yeah, just talks yeah, to his yeah, minions yeah. or he talks to himself. He, mo he monologues all the way through the movie. Oh, it's awful. He monologues. It's so You bad. caught me monologuing! And the other one I really enjoyed, yeah. I guess it, and I, I thought it was wonderful. And uh, I and the people who are criticising it are just so wrong. I, I thought The Last Jedi was wonderful. The Last Jedi was a good film. I thought it was absolutely it fantastic. Was it, it's, it's gone right up there with my top Star Wars movies. I love what it introduces into Star Wars mythology. Yep. In terms of the use of force powers, some people are going, oh, you've never seen them do that stuff before. It's like, well... Oh, my God, they're doing something with this made-up thing that they've never done before. Yeah. How dare they do something made up with a made-up thing? Shut up. What are you looking forward to this year? So... Uh, a couple of movies, uh, basically all the Marvel movies. Yeah, uh, Black Panther too. looks amazing. The Black Panther, uh, Ant Man and Wasp. Ant Man and Wasp. I'm very excited about. And obviously, Infinity War. Infinity War, without a doubt. Because I, I finally watched um, Spider Man Homecoming. Oh, uh, what? and it's joy, isn't it? It's beautiful. And the other movie I'm looking forward to, and it's a controversial choice, but I'm looking forward to Ready Player One. Yes, Ready Player I, One. I, un I understand why it's controversial. I do. I genuinely do. And it's basically just geek boys, gamer boys, you know, like, you know. I also think some people have a problem with it because some people are done with being nostalgic. I read the book back in 2011. I think okay. it was 2011, 2012. So Seven years ago. Around then. the time, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I've kind of like, so this is before like the likes of Stranger Things and the whole yeah. nostalgia thing. And I'm like, I like, I get it, I get it, but I just, I really enjoyed it. And so I am really looking forward, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how much money they spent on getting all the different licenses. Because like, we watched, I watched the trailer, it's like, there's a DeLorean, there's the light cycle, there's, uh, you know, like, Harley Quinn and Deadpool walking yeah, together in that Yeah, trailer. yeah, yeah, there's the Iron Giant, who's yeah. not in the book, but he's there. But and also because it's Spielberg, and Spielberg is a master of cinema as far as I'm concerned. He so. is, he is, he, he has done some questionable stuff. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the wine. I did. We've it's finished very nice. it. We've we've more or less finished it. Anything that you need to plug? Um, depends when this is going out, but I have always Star Trek versus Star Wars will be the main thing. Uh, is there somewhere they could? Is there a website, a Facebook? Page, yeah. If you go to my page? own, if you, right. So if you can, you can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram or Facebook. If you just search for Rick Carranza, uh, C A R R A N Z A. Uh, Put it on the screen. It's yeah. fine. 
It's brilliant. Yeah, because like when I see when I say it live, no one knows. Um, <laughs> and I've got my own website as well, uh, rickcarans.com, and I've got my listings there, so you can see everything. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for joining me. No, thank you. I don't do. <laughs> yeah, well, well, this has been Popcorn and Wine. I've been Matt Blair. See you again next time. Thanks again to Rick Carranza for joining us today on Popcorn and Wine. Please make sure you check out all of his links. It will be in the description below, the links for his social media, his website. You should definitely check out Star Trek versus Star Wars. It's a great debate show. It's a lot of fun. Make sure you also check out my social media links in the description below as well. And remember, I'm part of the Distraction Club, which is a monthly musical comedy night. Check out that on Facebook. I'm also part of a double act called Ray Guns Look Real Enough, and we play all over the country. And we've got some cool things coming up this year, which I'll let you know about on my Twitter. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you once again for watching. My name's Matt Blair. This has been Popcorn and Wine. We'll see you again next time.